Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species, uh, a, a special spooky night uh, because we've assembled uh, some very fascinating, interesting, spooky uh, horror, uh, tales of wonder, and the whole package. Uh, it, it's called Spooky Space. That's the, the publication that we're going to be talking about. Uh, so I'm with Gary Hill. Uh, and Elizabeth Lynn Blackson and Eileen Eggert. Uh, we're going to have uh, a lot of fun talking about uh, space and spooky things and 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 your writing because uh, we were talking about before we went on air. Uh, uh, and we're going to talk about where your imagination comes from to write this stuff. I've read it; it's fascinating. We're going to talk about all that. So this is a, a special time, and more importantly. Uh, uh, Spooky Space will be available, um, is available on Amazon, correct, Gary? On Amazon. Huh? I don't do Amazon anymore. Oh, okay. So where is it? You can just jump right in and tell us where where, where is it going to be um, available. Two places, lulu.com slash spotlight slash strange sound. Okay. Or you if can... you go to garyhillauthor.com and look at the Tales of Wonder and Dread Perfect. pages, you'll You're see gonna... You're gonna send that to me, uh, and anyway, I, I I jumped the I jumped the gun. So, uh, <laughs> my little monologue, uh, my Johnny Carson monologue is is over, and we're gonna now jump in. I think the best thing to do, uh, uh, and we'll we'll kind of go clockwise. Uh, Gary, do a little bio, a little history, some contact information, uh, and and then we'll kind of go around a circle. Take it away, Gary. Okay, so um, I'm Gary Hill, and I think you know, it's been a little while since I've been on one of these with Calvin, but uh, for a while there, I was coming on pretty frequently. So um, I've been running Music Street Journal for since 1998, and um, I started gradually doing other writing after that. I uh, wrote for All Music Guide and um, a lot of different things. My first book, uh, Strange Sound of Cthulhu, music inspired by the writings of H.P. Lovecraft was published in 2006. And um, five years ago, I started Tales of Wonder and Dread. And Tales of Wonder and Dread Publishing is about science fiction and horror and some generally macabre sort of stuff beyond that. But, um, and the, the I've got five books that came out September 4th and Spooky Space is one of those five. And the idea behind Spooky Space is stories that are somewhat spooky, at least, and take place either in space or they're centered around space. And we've got uh, two stories from myself, um, Prelude to War and The Stars, which The Stars was previously published, uh, Prelude to War is not. And we've got one from Elizabeth and one from Eileen, which I'll let them talk to you about. And we've also got a story from H.P. Lovecraft because my story, Prelude to War, ties into it. And the story about Lovecraft is the color out of space. And um, so we've got, like I said, five books coming out, though that, but that's just one of them uh, on the fourth. And I guess that's pretty much a, a decent little bio. Okay. Moving around the clock, uh, Eileen uh, Eggert, um, take it away. Okay. Uh, my name is Eileen Eggert. Um, I'm from New Jersey, and I wrote a story called uh, The Dead Planet for Spooky Space. And uh... <laughs> I hate this. I don't want to say. <laughs> We're going to talk about Dead Planet. That's yeah. fine. Okay. Um, maybe, this... maybe you want to talk about your your uh, your music thing that you do. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. My, oh, yeah. my, my, prim my band, primary... Though. Yeah, my primary hobby is with my uh, sea shanty band, the Sea Dogs, where we dress like pirates and sing uh, songs of the sea and sea shanties. And um, we uh, we are also a living history group, so um, we bring lots of weapons and treasure and all kinds of fun stuff for the kids to see. And, uh, <laughs> and this this past weekend, we we had a an event in Cape May, New Jersey, where we camped out all weekend in a, in a haunted village <laughs> called historic cold spring village wow. and uh that was that was a lot of fun wow um so you do a lot of reenactments and you know yeah. you're in an area that's loaded with history 
Yeah, and it started out doing uh, reenacting the American Revolution, and then uh, we just have the the pirate things a bit of a spin off from that. Uh -huh. Well, that's great, uh, Elizabeth. Well, pirates more fun, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. I uh, I guess I started working with Gary uh, what three years ago now, something like that. I have no idea how we got hooked up. It was like a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend thing. And uh, I started actually in some uh, in some group and we commented on each other's on a thread together or something and then friended each other. And... and I ended up submitting some short stories for some of his previous collections, which I've been in, which uh, Cal, you've hosted us on one of those books, the Spooky Houses, I think it was. Yep. Um, and then you had me on again when I released my novel, uh, A Girl's Gotta Eat, right, again, right. again, published through uh, Tales of Wonder and Dread. Gary's my editor. And and luckily, he is a very gentle editor because I am a <laughs> I am a fragile little ego. <laughs> um, I, but I, I was going to say for this book, particularly this story, um, I had worked in the gaming industry doing role-playing game stuff, and I, I co-wrote a uh, supplement for the Serenity role-playing game called Six Shooters and Spaceships, and I did the spaceships. I did deck plans and statistics and crew members and things like that. I spent a lot of time playing that game and a lot of time thinking about the mechanics of how actual space, living in space, would work, yeah. and a lot of that comes through in my story, so... Well, I, I wanted we, we're going to touch on that a little bit more in depth where all this stuff comes from. By the way, you said something interesting, and, and I have to do a, a personal commercial uh, because uh, this is when we see this. This is going to be available. Uh, my my second novel, "There's a Tortoise in My Hair: A Journey to Spirit." Uh, it's available on Amazon and just about any other place you can want to buy books. Uh, but what's funny, uh, uh, you talk about editing. And and uh, I had an editor uh, for this, uh, um, and it, it went to the editor. Uh, and it's funny; editing is really funny. And 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 I completely uh, uh, simpatico with you, Elizabeth, about editing. Um, and 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 for us as writers, at least in my opinion, uh, every word that we have is one of our children. You know, these are our words, and, mm -hmm. and I sent it to the editor. Uh, open-minded enough to know this is the editor i'm not an editor and i have to go with the flow so the mm -hmm. this manuscript went to my uh, editor um at 125,000 words and it came back to me two and a half months later uh, at 94 oh geez thousand ouch i don't, I don't I was an ouch I don't like doing that. as an editor i don't like taking stuff out of people's things if i do i'm going to have a conversation with them about it um, Elizabeth and I, I think we've gotten a really good working relationship on the two books that we've done so far. We just sort of pass them back and forth. We make edits. If I have questions, I ask her. And sometimes I'll be like, you know, I think this should be changed to this. And sometimes Elizabeth's like, you know what, that's all right. Other times she's like, well, here's why I think it shouldn't. And I'll be like, hey, that makes sense to me. It always feels to me when you do that, like I'm hoarding my little clutch of words going, no, you can't have them. Go to hell, you monster. <laughs> I, uh, I, mean, I, I, I made uh, up front and up front and, and it was a decision if I'm going to use an editor I got to go with the I'm not an editor I don't know uh, and, and this was a, a she was a 15 year veteran of, of publishing and, and not one word that I keep whatever she said goes went uh, and, and, um, and and I guess I, I guess I, I got I guess I, I got very mature. Uh, and I, I, I tend to be I tend to be a little more on the artistic side of that equation. Um, having been a musician who was very much a prog rock guy and did a lot of uh, jazz uh, jamming and stuff. It's like I, I sort of think, yeah, there are rules and there are things that people are like, well, it's got to fit into this. I kind of throw those out the window um, because I think that the artistic side of it needs to win out. I, and, I agree, and, and 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 I have an unusual voice. It's my voice. It's like my fingerprint for each mm -hmm. one of you. It's a fingerprint. It's my voice. But uh, I I you know I bit the bullet and, and and I accepted with without any reservation. When it came back to me, this is this was it. 
you know, there were four or five chapters in Hull that completely got wiped out. Well, and, and to be fair, those people who are like that and who um, you know fine tune them like that, they probably have really good success rates at getting books out there that people are going to read and people are going to buy. I tend to think, I, uh, you know, my motto is I like to publish books that I want on my bookshelf. And so I want the artistic side represented more than that. Um, I want the artist's vision to be more clear. And I, I I'm agree. Not to, uh, I'm not too point. concerned about whether they sell or not. Yes, I love them to sell, but it's not the primary goal at all. Primary goal is to get a good book out there. So uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see uh, uh, as, as this hits the airwaves. So let's um, let's go back to Gary and let's talk about uh, before we do a general discussion, let's just talk about uh, Prelude to War. Uh, how did it come about? What's it about? Uh, we could talk a little bit about it. I, I just thought it was a brilliant, because I'm a huge fan of that movie. I knew you were, yeah. Huge. Uh, huge. I, I am too, and the story and the rock opera and everything. Um, so... First off, let me just mention that there's I do have the other story in there, the stars, which is um a Lovecraftian piece. Um, which is it starts off you think it's just a total space opera kind of thing, and then it completely twists into a total Lovecraft mythos piece. Um that one has been published several times in some of my books before, but I just fit, figured it fit into this. So Prelude to War, um I had been um doing I had done some fractured fairy tales basically some reworkings of some fairy tales for a book earlier this year and i got to thinking you know what public domain stories could you take and do some twists on or do some different things with and i got thinking about war of the worlds um because i'm a huge fan of war of the worlds as well i remember as a kid watching the movie on tv and just falling in love with it and then getting the hg wells book and reading it and uh Jeff Wayne did brilliant, brilliant uh, rock opera of uh, Jeff Wayne's version of A War of the Worlds or whatever it's called. Um, and I inter I've interviewed him a couple of times. And so I'm a big, big fan of War of the Worlds. Well, I'm also a huge Lovecraft fan. And I got thinking, what if um, what happened in a color out of the color out of space happened on Mars before it happened on Earth? And that's why the Martians need to invade because the planet has been destroyed because of it. But I made it, I guess it's spoiler for anybody who's seeing this and not read the story, but because I tried to make it unclear as to what planet they were on and, you know, just sort of describing. It's basically a conversation between a trainer telling these guys, hey, here's how you're going to get into your little meteor ships and you're going to take them to the target and he's explaining everything, and it's their training, final training mission. And I wanted to try to make them think that they might be human. I mean, there's some things that are pretty obviously not human in the way they word things, but um, I'm hoping that it you get pretty far into the story before you would actually realize that they're coming to Earth. But um, I just sort of thought it would be neat to combine those two things as in a prelude to both of them, because it's the idea is that this happened on Mars and it happened before the events of the Colorado space. Um, so that, that's just sort of merged them together like that. I, I kind of, I've been thinking about doing some other things like that, like maybe doing a project where um, people do other stories related to Edgar Allan Poe stories or related directly to uh, Lovecraft stories. I just think it would be interesting to play off of those sort of universes. I've also I had a, idea in mind that we've been working on. Elizabeth and I both got our stories in for it, but none of the other people have yet, which is just we've got certain criteria and you create a story using those criteria, but you can do whatever you want within that. I like the whole idea of different writers writing with the same general rules, but coming up with something completely different. I think it's wow. kind of fascinating. Wow. Sort of like I, I always wanted to see a movie where you give like four directors the exact same story and see what they do with it, see what each one does with it and have, have it as one movie. You know, I like those sort of variants on a theme. So I guess that's sort of where it came from. Okay. 
Um, by the way, uh, I, I, we could talk about content, um, um, but you 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 deal about you you dealt uh, with with the concept of coexisting, which is a heavy concept because we don't do very well coexisting here on Earth. No. Not not with the environment, not with each other, uh, not with even within the same city. It's a hard. Humans are terrible at it. <laughs> but uh, I I like the fact you you brought that up, and it was a discussion point uh, as they were prepping, and 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 that was one of the things that that kind of resonated with me the the co the, the coexisting. So it was kind of heavy, and I I liked that the thought that you know even aliens may even dwell on the subject of coexist and and, and, and and did you like how how their whole argument was well we've watched them we know what they do they don't coexist with each other why would they coexist that, with there us? you go exactly what i'm saying uh, you know yeah. uh, it's exactly what i'm saying we just don't do a very good job with that we never have not in two thousand years so moving on um to the dead planet uh eileen uh talk about that um by the way, I loved um, Tam uh, uh, has a six thousand year old brain, and it kind of made me like, "Wow, you know, it's, wow." Uh, but anyway, tell, talk about um, talk about that. All right, uh, the Dead Planet is a, a main character is um, Tom Tamaril, who likes to be called Tam, and he is about six thousand years old and. He so comes from a planet that never changes, and he gets bored. He doesn't want to live in a place where it never changes, so he decides he's going to see the universe. So he's traveling around, and he comes to this planet that he sure is uninhabited because of a war that happened that wiped everybody out. And he lands, and it's not uninhabited, <laughs> and it's under attack. So he has to try to help out. Okay. Um, uh, I, I love we'll talk about imagination where you come up with these things and, and the whole teleporting and, and, and the blue eyes very visual and 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 and, and, and a, that's a powerful story and of course there are always lessons you can take to modern life and and i always like how you can go from heavy duty imagination spooky stuff and and use that uh for modern life and there are lessons about modern life uh there how long did it take you to write that um, not too long. Once I started putting it down, like I'm, okay. I'm, um, I have stuff in my head that's been there for a really long time, and that's one that was there for years. Okay. And I only just wrote it down recently because my husband was getting stuff published, and I thought, gee, maybe I could do that. So. I, I I have all these stories in my head that I just never actually wrote down before. Okay. So this is the this is the first one I actually got finished writing down. Well, very very um, for me very enjoyable reading. Uh, I I like to have this thing up here expanded. Um, okay, um, Elizabeth, um, terrors of a tin can uh, ape. Um, the, you, you know, um, and, and, and he's, uh, uh, he travels around, you know, gathering up, uh, ore to sell. He's, uh, he's kind of a miner, you know, he's like I, in the old West, but not, he's uh, way into the future. Uh, um, so talk about the origins of that. Uh, uh it's about as imaginative <clears throat> a story that, that. Uh, and I and I said this before you went on air. I I um, am learning how to read you. It's uh, a it's a difficult. It's a crunchy story. It's, it's got a, a lot of science story. and stuff. Uh, it's a crunchy <laughs> story. Uh, uh, and there are there are things and concepts that 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 grab me. We we talked about it, but talk a little bit about um, that story. It was. I, I mentioned that I had done a supplement for. A Firefly role playing game, which is a space western, and and it's people living on what they call the raggedy edge. It's it's life, but it's not safe. The story, this story came from the the seed of it came from a song that I had listened to called Kodokushi by a 
rap artist named Aesop Rock. And the word Kotokushi means a lonely death. Like when you die and no one notices that you die, no one comes to check on you. You're just alone somewhere and you die. And I thought it would be even more horrible if this was out in the cold of space where you didn't even have the benefit of being consumed by the earth, you know, going back into the earth. You just froze solid and were a corpse sickle for 10,000 years. And all of those fears, I didn't want to do a monster. I didn't want to do aliens popping out of people's eyeballs or any of that, which I love. But what I wanted to do were the fears that really, you know, claustrophobia, suffocation, freezing to death. Uh, and then the the ultimate fear, I won't release, you know, I won't say it here, but the fear that the, the uh, first person narrator faces at the end of the story is something that they totally did not expect. It was, it was kind of, I want this, this is my dream. And oh my God, if I could ever experience it. And once they do, they find out how horrible it is because of their life, uh, the way they've lived their life. So I liked, uh, there were a few things I, uh, they, they, on this spaceship, they used hydroponics. I, I thought that was cool. And, and I, I wrote that down because right. we're going to need to use hydroponics here more and more and more if we want to eat and survive. That's another story for another day. And we talked about this also before we went on air that uh, even way into the future and all over the universe, uh, you have methamphetamine comes into to play to, to kind of stay awake when you got to stay awake i got a right. kick out of that yeah they were the the survival kit that the the narrator talks about they crack it open and it's supposed to have a certain number of supplies one of them is if you're in dire situations and you're about to die here's methamphetamine and it wasn't like you're supposed to have five doses or whatever and there were two left and that was supposed to be a, a clear clue of like this is how close to the edge of death you you wow. ride you know wow. Interesting. Uh, by the way, I think I do mention at some point in the story the narrator is female, but I only think I say it once. Um, yeah, I think I remember that. You know, I, I remember. Uh, yeah, uh, and and I I I picked up on that uh, as well. Um, okay. Um, general question for the group, uh, uh, although I've hinted at this this question. Uh, each one of your your pieces uh, hugely imaginative, beyond, and and I just want to know where that comes from. Is I mean where where is it life experience, uh, the things you've plunged into? Uh, uh, when did this when did this imagination <clears throat> begin in your journey? Uh, in the in the seventies, there was a show that was coming out of Cleveland called Superhost. And it was a matinee show. The guy who was a weatherman through the rest of the week would put on this silly costume and show two matinee movies that were creature features or sci-fi movies or universal monster movies. And I blame that guy for cramming my head full of cheesy 50 sci-fi and Ray How Harry Housen movies and Three Stooges and uh abbott and costello meet frankenstein and all that stuff <laughs> well i as as far as imagination i can't tell you when it started i can tell you a story i've never told anyone publicly i didn't i think i've told my wife this but yeah, in fact i know i have but um when i was in grade school like maybe first grade my teacher called my mother and had her come in to talk to her because i was fairly convincing about the fact that I was from Mars and that I was just adopted by my parents. So she wanted to know, is he really adopted? Which I wasn't and all this stuff. Um, so I've obviously had a vivid imagination since I was a little kid. Um, it, and I remember in middle school, I wrote uh, comic books. In fact, my, uh, my first uh, science fiction short novel that I published a couple of years ago, Wizard Song is actually based on a comic book that I originally wrote when I was 12 years old. Um, and I also wrote movie scripts that I would um, show to my friends and they loved them. Um, and so, you know, th it's been a part of my life forever. Ali. Oh, okay. As far as my imagination, I remember um, when I was really young, uh, 
going to my mother and saying, I'm bored. I need something to do. I'm bored. And she said, well, find something to do. And I said, like what? And she said, use your imagination. So I did. She found, she came into the living room later to find me sitting on the couch, just deep in my own head. And uh, that's now it's, it sort of became automatic after a while. Every, every time that I'm not focusing on something external, I'm in my own head and entertaining myself. And I've never been bored since. <laughs> There's a lot of room back there. Yeah. Back, back in that crazy place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. To go along with this imagination question, uh, and, and this is, it's a little bit more practical. Um, growing up, uh, I know I, I know Gary's, uh, part of Gary's answer. What were some of your inspirations, jolts, things, you know, in media, in, in your world that, that helped inspire you? I, I think I read, Gary, you, you were a Star Trek fan. Oh, yeah. That's, that's probably my first and foremost. Um, my real father... Uh, left when I was seven years old, but I have memories of watching Star Trek with him, which means that has to have been the first run, 63 to 66, when I was really little, I remember watching it. So I was a Star Trek fanatic from then. And then it ties in with the spooky space thing is that I was also a huge Dark Shadows fan. When I was in grade school, we would all run home after school to watch it. And um, and I was also a big comic book heroes thing. So kind of those three things sort of created the the mush that is <laughs> my world that I write in. I think and and think in. Plus, you know, a little later on when Kolshak the Night Stalker came out, I was hooked on that too. Great show. Uh, still a huge fan. Great show. So I guess that's sort of my mishmash. Oh, the funny thing is, then when when I was twelve, by the time I was twelve, when I did Wizard, when I came up with Wizard Song. I had also discovered progressive rock. And so uh, for that one, comic books, heroes, Star Trek, and progressive rock all merged into sort of a tale. Um, but yeah, so those were the kind of the, the multi mass media things that got to me. Okay. Anybody else inspirations from growing up? Largely the same of what as what Gary said, Star Trek, Star Wars, Space 1999, um, later in the early 90s, a series that really got me as far as the writing was Babylon 5. I fell deep into that as a fan. Um, uh, again, I was also into comics. I was always a Marvel Comics fan, primarily Spider-Man and X-Men. And X-Men, for a while, I was I was pretty deep into. I've done some writing in um, Marvel Universe things. Again, it was supplements for role-playing games. Uh, so I'm pretty well steeped in that um horror stuff just like i my sister and i would read each other stephen king novels when we were kids so just eat they eat that stuff like candy i mean yeah um let's see i was i was about eight when the first star wars movie came out so that was a huge influence and then um on nickelodeon when cable was brand new they, they would show a lot of british science fiction and i really liked the i really liked that stuff and then uh, later, like Doctor Who, and on PBS and stuff. And um, I also really liked X Men. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's uh, that's all just a huge influence on me. If you would ask me that, uh, when I grew up, there was a TV show called Zachary. Oh yeah. You remember? Uh, and I actually met him a, a few years ago before he passed. Too, yeah, but yeah. He was in his upper nineties, and he was he was at this Chilla Theater thing. Mm -hmm. That's where I saw him. Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. we were there the same day. Oh, so you guys were both the same thing. <laughs> yeah, right, we were there the same day, and and, and I got a picture. Uh, uh, I took a picture of him, but uh, uh, I was so taken with that show and and the vampire movies that um, uh, I'm I'm way older than my sisters, so I used to babysit for my sisters. Uh, and, and I'd be watching that stuff, and 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 it, and I was listen. I don't know, maybe I was 13, 14, uh, no more than that. And, and I'm watching Zachary and uh, and you know the vampire, all that stuff, to the point where I don't know if I ever mentioned this to you, Gary, but uh, uh, I was so 
I don't even think enamored is the right word. I was so taken with that and believed it that my parents went out and I watched this horrible uh, uh, vampire movie and, 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 and I just had to do something to protect. So I went into my mother's spice cabinet and I got garlic powder. And I swear to God, I did this and, and, and I, I opened up all the windows and on the windowsills, I put <laughs> garlic powder. Uh, and the next morning, my mother's running around the house. What the hell am I smelling? True story. <laughs> but that that is the power, you know, of media in, in an impressionable 12 or 13 year old uh, kid. Um, just, rem just remember this, that if you can't get fresh garlic, garlic powder will do in a pinch. <laughs> is that true? I, I didn't know. That. The vampire, I, my vampire universe, it doesn't work. Uh. Uh, <laughs> and, and I've read some. Uh, I've got some pretty powerful vampire stories uh, recently with you guys. Um, um, real fast, uh, uh, in reading the intro uh, to to Spooky Space, uh, there was a, a dichotomy. Uh, you can't mix uh, space and spooky. And oh yeah, uh, that was, that was interesting, and that that actually sort of played into the idea of behind the book. There was a. There was a, a flap a while, a couple of years ago, with uh, someone who said that you can't have horror in space. And, you know, there were a lot of people who responded to it. And there was somebody else, uh, at I think it was Daw or Tor.com, who said that no, every piece of fiction in space is horror because the entire universe is out to kill you. Um, and I think the answer probably lies somewhere in between, but it's closer to everything in the universe is out to kill you. So it's all horror. Yeah, it's a very hostile environment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I suppose in some ways you could say that even on Earth, everything's out to kill you too. Mother Nature is out to kill you from the moment you're born. But... Well, at least in Australia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, definitely. definitely. <laughs> I yeah, was thinking been... that the, also we've seen a couple, <clears throat> a couple really good examples of the, the uh, enclosed, trapped in a haunted house kind of thing done in sci-fi, um, Event Horizon, for instance, you're trapped on this derelict ship that is Nightmare. That. that movie's brilliant. And of course, you got Alien. Alien, yeah, that's kind of the prototype. One, there's one from the 50s that um, is considered to be sort of where Alien got a lot of their uh, ideas. I can't re remember the name of it now, but um, they've showed it on Spanguli a couple times recently. There's uh, another 50s movie where they um, they land on Mars and everybody and everybody gets killed except the captain of the ship. And so the sh rescue ship thinks he killed them. But in fact, there's this monster and they bring it on board their ship when they're heading back to Earth. And wow. It's there to everybody. Yeah. Wow. I also think of like uh, um, the thing and the thing from outer space. Uh, oh, yeah. You're trapped in an isolated location. You're dealing with extraterrestrial life, and it's hostile. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because I, I talk about this with my son all the time. Uh, I grew up; it was called the Thing with James Arness. Mm -hmm. uh, right. You know, the, the the and he plays the the creature and, and mm -hmm. he's buried under the ice. Uh, and, and I'm listen. I'm an old movie person, and and it, it is my impression. Uh, and that was a kind of another question I want to ask you. You know, favorite movies, books. That's one of my favorite movies. The the dialogue in that movie and the suspense created was beyond, in in my opinion. It was the writing of that was so crisp and powerful, uh, and and so so way ahead of its time. It was gripping. The whole the whole story that went on and and everything about it, uh, I just thought it it was a remarkable movie. Maybe it didn't get enough credit. I I thought, uh, my opinion. And do you guys have favorite movies like that? I'm sure I do, but I can't think. I mean, there's like it depends on your your mood and the flavor of movies. Like I like horror movies occasionally that are just dumb, silly, like a. Tucker and Dale versus Evil, which oh, yeah. is just a slack slapstick horror. 
an uh, early Peter Jackson one I saw that was called Dead Alive, also known as Brain Dead. That's just slapstick horror. But then I also like serious, you know, deep um, bone chilling kind of horror too. <clears throat> I keep saying horror. I write way more in horror than I do in sci-fi. This is the story in this book is one of a handful, only a handful of sci-fi stories I've done because mostly I like just scaring the hell out of people more. <laughs> Well, that's nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I were to pick a movie or two, I mean, I can't, can't really. Well, you know, the the recent version, the adaptation of the Color Out of Space, called just Color Out of Space by Richard Stanley, it has rocketed to be my favorite horror movie. I absolutely love that movie, and the um, way they use the colors in oh, that yeah. movie. And the way they use the CGI, some of that, like there's a, yeah. there's a, a, a modified adapted uh, grasshopper thing that is just amazing. You look at it and you think, is that real? And they just did something to it, but it's not. It's yeah. it's all CGI. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely they brought it into the modern age, but I thought they did a good job of sort of preserving the basic concept of the story. Um, and when you talk about the thing, something interesting about that original version of the thing the thing from another world it was called and you were talking about the dialogue there's something interesting i haven't seen a lot of that director's work but one of the things he's famous for that he does that a lot of other people don't is having characters sort of talking at the same time and right. people either love that or they don't really care for it it kind of bothers me because it's hard for me to follow the dialogue sometimes um I do love the remake, but well, it's not actually a remake though. Let me rephrase that. They're both based on the same story, but they're actually separate adaptations of the John Carpenter one, but I'm a John Carpenter fanatic. So, um, but it's, it's brilliant. Like Elizabeth was talking about that one too, how they trapped the, the Arctic and, and or Antarctica and they're just this things there and, you know, it can take the shape of anybody and, what the claustrophobia and paranoia are yeah. two of the things I love the way they're played in that movie. Yeah. I mean, that's, I guess that cluster of movies, they're all sort of the same story. Yeah. And there's a, there's a whole thing with, uh, you know, with, you know, we're so tired and we don't know, we can't trust anyone. And it's like, you're just, that's the thing about something like that. If you're trapped there, it's going to just literally wear you down. You can't be alert constantly you know, you're going to be vulnerable at some point. And when you are, well, you're vulnerable. Yep. Uh, that, that, like I said, that for me, that was one of the most, um, it, it just sat with me and lasted for a long, long time, that movie. And, and it, it's just, uh, it's just phenomenal. Uh, and, and by the way, it, it, we were talking about that before we went on air too. Uh, it's, it's, you know, this stuff goes on and, you know, the, the Congress is trying to undo some of this UFO stuff and, and kind of share it with all of us. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Um, uh, segwaying, uh, and I thought I thought this, the fact that you guys are going to be here uh, and your, your writers to talk about the institution, the relatively new institution of chat GPT and AI and how that can and might uh, or will uh, influence and come into your worlds. Uh, and uh, we can also segue some of that AI stuff to the movie from Forbidden Planet. We didn't talk about that, I guess, before we went on air. Um, but uh, I'm just, uh, I, I've been doing more and more reading about AI. It fascinates me. Uh, uh, I'm basically petrified of it. And we got a great example uh, of uh, AI uh, in Stanley Kubrick's movie 2001 mm -hmm. when Hal takes over. That was written by Arthur Clarke who warned, who wrote 2001 and he warned the world back in 2000, I'm sorry um, that came out in, that came out in two, 2001 came out in the 60s so Arthur Clarke in 1964 came out and said he worries and he fears that that we're going to create machines that'll take us over. 
So he said that way back. So anyway, this is a huge question, just some thoughts uh, as horror writers uh, uh, about AI and all this stuff that's coming. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. Gary, did, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, well, you know, I've actually thought about it a lot. I mean, just talking about the, the chat GPT and all that, when the um, graphic stuff first came out, I actually used it a few times. I used it to create a couple pieces of merch and I used it on a couple book covers because I didn't understand at the time that it was going and, and basically plagiarizing artists' work. And so since I've known that, those, those things are still out there. They're available. I'm not going to pull them, but I won't use it anymore. Um, and I also think that, you know, people who use it for writing are really just sort of cheating and they're not really writing. I could see there might be some very limited usage of it, um, perhaps set out of an outline or if you're having problems figuring out how a certain scene should go, you do it and then you, you know, get an idea from it and then write, rewrite it yourself. I could see some very limited use of that. As far as the bigger AI thing, um, I'm really, really terrified of it because computers can think faster than us, obviously. Um, they don't make the mistakes we do. They don't have the emotion that we have. Um, and if we put them in charge of things um, and we suddenly decide that's a really bad idea, just like in 2001, although it would be much harder than in 2001, trying to get them out of control of it and take, take it back away from them would be next to impossible because everything you can think of, they will have thought of ahead of you. Um, there'll always be steps and steps ahead of you. And I also think that as human beings, a lot of us are thoughtful and think, you know, we've got to put a lot of training wheels on this thing and a lot of safeguards, but there are others who are just going to go straight forward. And the problem is we only need a handful of those people. And it, once it gets out of control, it's out of control. And I think it's almost inevitable um, for that to happen. I really, really hope, and you know, this is, I hope that our government and all the governments around the world are investing in EMP technology because that'd be about the only thing you could use against them. Um, I don't know if you know, but that's an electromagnetic pulse, which is something that's generated when a nuclear weapon goes off and it basically eliminates all electronic devices in the area wipes them out. A lot of them will never function again. Some of them will after time. And there are actually devices that can be built. It's illegal to build them, by the way. Don't look it up or do it. You wind up with the FBI on you. But you can build them um, and use them. And all it will do, it doesn't have the nuclear explosion. It just shuts off ele everything electronic within a certain radius. Um, I really hope and I believe that all the governments of the world are probably investing in that technology and stockpiling that stuff. Because if AI does start to take over, that's what we'll need to fight it. And we'll have to basically take ourselves back to the pre-electronic pre age to, to win. Uh, the only thing I was going to add about chat GPT and AI was it's very, uh, it adds, it goes back to what I think Cal said earlier about the voice of an author. You can teach a computer how to formulate English sentences. You can teach it how to put these pieces in various orders, but you can't give it a, you can't teach it <clears throat> that, uh, that creative spark, I guess. That's the in, entire difference. You can create, you can create, and I've heard a lot of scripts written in uh, AI and they all sound very <clears throat> kind of that middle of the road um, reporter, like not a great reporter, just an average reporter that gets the facts out and it sounds dead. And that's what I always think of with chat GPT. AI art I am furious about because an artist can take a lifetime learning their craft and then have some, I'm going to say, can I say bad words on this? Probably not. <laughs> oh. Some some crappy it. crap that, that craps their crap and they steal the crap and it's <laughs> you know what I mean. Works fine. It's, it's it's ripping off somebody who worked a lifetime to develop a skill and then a computer comes along and Correct. steals it. Correct. 
scary stuff, and that's why they're striking because they see the the handwriting on the wall. Uh, did you see? Did you see that one proposal that they were making to the actors? Extras can come in and they'll get paid for one day, and they will scan them, and then they can use the scans to create AI of them in perpetuity. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you get paid for one day's work, and you're never going to work again. Yeah, yeah, this is the whole. This is the whole. We're going to have you train the person that's going to replace you. Yep. Scary stuff. Scary stuff. You know, you were talking about. Uh, I was experimenting with AI, and I interviewed Josh up in Vancouver, and and to promote and come up with a thumbnail for that, uh, I went into one of those AI things, and I said, uh, I'm. I said to the, I typed in, I'm petrified of AI. Can you give me a picture uh, 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 showing my fear of AI? And this is what it spit out. <laughs> oh, wow. These are my pictures. I, uh, well, Cal, you know, not, this Cal is it turns out, it turns out that AI is just as afraid of you as you are. Of it. <laughs> Isn't that great? Uh, and actually, I used uh, I used one of these, the one that was the least offensive. I thought up here, uh, um, uh, in 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 you know my thumbnail thing to promote that that interview. But I, I just I got a you know I got a kick out of that. Um, it, it's, you know, it's interesting. I, I some years ago when I was beginning my journalism, long story, but I I got involved in in something called Singularity. And it was All right. the, Ray Kurzweil and, and the theory of singularity is in, in 2030 or 2035, man and machine merge. So uh, he built, he has this university to discuss all this stuff, uh, the potential of all this stuff going on. He's a brilliant man. He's got about 160 PhDs uh, you know, from everything and anything. I actually talked to him. We, we compared notes because I, I take a lot of supplements. And he actually had me beat. I take 60 a day since 1969. Uh, I think it works because this thing is functioning really well, you know, for somebody 78 um, tomorrow. Uh, but happy, happy birthday, yeah. man. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, uh, but the point being, yeah, he takes 160. I take only 60. But uh, but in that, it was a three day conference in New York and he brought in 40 or 50 of these unbelievable minds from all over the world to talk about different topics relating to the whole over uh, the overload topic of, of uh, um, you know, man versus machine, the merging. Uh, but he, he, he interviewed, uh, uh, and this has scared me, uh, this, this Russian scientist who was working on taking this, and this kind of fits into what you guys write about, so he takes this, my, you know, th this is a body, but this is my essence. And he hooks up like a USB thing to here, and he transfers all of this to an Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator cyborg, mm -hmm. and therefore giving me uh, eternal life. You know, they can replace the parts, but my essence goes into that. Um, and he said it was like 30, 40 years away. And and, and of all the things I, I took away from that three-day conference, that was the thing that scared me the most. And I've asked people about that. And I said that that could never happen. Whatever. So um last question, just kind of a um a kind of a fun question. Uh um, and then we'll do a wrap. Uh what um what what is your um what would constitute uh, a perfect day for each one of you, Gary? I don't think I could pick one. <laughs> I, mean, I have different days. I'm in the mood for different things. Um, you know, I have a lot of things I enjoy. So uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I could pick one, to be honest. Okay, that's, that's, that's valid. I mean, perfect day for me is not having to leave the house. <laughs> like that that's, that's mostly my life so yeah <laughs> i like that i do like that elizabeth i actually have an idea for a perfect day and i try to have it once a year in uh late oct no sorry late november uh my hubby takes a day off work during the week 
we go to the St. Louis Zoo, which in mid-November is not busy. It's usually that nice, crisp autumn air. Hopefully, in, on a perfect day, all of the big cats would be out sunning themselves, and you get to see all that. That's great. Uh, after that, we go for Indian food uh, buffet for lunch, have a nice two-hour nap to sleep off eating too much curry, um, go out for another trip, usually to the art museum. That's a per that's the perfect day. And that's a perfect way to end our little panel chat. Uh, hey, this has been great, guys uh, and gals. Uh, this has been uh, this has been a great little session. I, I love doing these sessions. Uh, we've done a few of these, Gary, because they're always creative and innovative and and kind of mind expanding things and it was very nice meeting you Arlene uh, yeah, nice meeting. and and um I again I just want to thank you for your time and your graciousness and uh to be continued I, I like that to be continued so uh, we're going to sign off don't leave I'm just going to stop the recording and uh I listen I wish you only good things everybody okay we're going to stop recording <laughs>